Okay, so it's two weeks now since that exit poll came out, and I think, you know, lots of people, if you were watching the results, and it was a moment of, no, that, that must be wrong, I'll go to bed, it'll all be fine when I get up in the morning. And of course, when we got up in the morning, um, the worst had happened, you know, it was worse than I was expecting. I suppose you could argue that a Tory UKIP uh, coalition would have been worse, but, you know, we got a Tory majority government for the first time in, in many, many years. Um, you know, in fact, the last time we had that was just before the first election that I ever voted in, which was the, the landslide um, Tony Blair um, election in 1997. And as soon as the Tories got re-elected, there was a whole number of signals which showed who is happy about this. You know, so you had, of course, the pictures of the crates of champagne being delivered to 10 Downing Street for the, for the celebration uh, for Cameron uh, and his friends. You had uh, Foxton's, the um, estate agent that's most associated with the kind of gentrification of various parts of, uh, of cities around Britain, uh, saw their shares go up 12%. Um, overnight, you had hundreds of millions of pounds worth of property deals going through on that Friday, um, with from you know rich buyers and investors who'd been holding off in case uh, they got in and there was uh, and there was a mansion tax. So you could see that people in the city, uh, in the city of London, um, celebrating that the Tories got in. And I think on our side, there was, you know, for lots of people, a sense of depression, of despondency, of, oh my God, I can't believe we've got five more years um, of the Tories. And straight away, you know, you think about um, uh, the, the kind of Labour Party figures from the past that we could do with, you know, uh, in lots of ways, that would be a head and shoulders ahead of the, the Labour Party that we've got today, and of anyone like Miliband, um, Nye Bevan who was um, a, a Labour Party figure who said 50 years ago, as far as I'm concerned, Tories are lower than vermin. They condemned millions of first-class people to semi-starvation. Of course, he was talking about the Depression in the 1930s. Half a century later, we've got a million people visiting food banks in this country, one of the richest countries um, in the world. This is what it, Tory Britain means, um, and that's what we've got now. You know, so we're all, I think, asking ourselves, how is it possible that after five years of austerity and, and you know, some of the worst economic situation that we've seen in generations, how have they managed to get re-elected and, and even more uh, strongly than before? Um, so that's a question that I'm going to try and look at. Uh, and I think a lot of that is to do with the Labour Party losing the election rather than the Tories winning it. But also, I just want to say before I go on, you know, it isn't all doom and gloom because on that Friday morning I felt very depressed and I know a lot of people went into work feeling um, very depressed. But actually there's a whole, you know, thousands and thousands of very young people, a lot of them too young to even have voted, but had this instinctive understanding straight away of what it meant for the Tories. They didn't know they were meant to be despondent and depressed for a couple of weeks. They just went out on the streets, outside um, Downing Street on that Saturday straight after the election and protested, even though the official demonstration had been called off um, by the People's Assembly um, at that time. You know, but there were other you know, little protests that had been called and people turned out because they wanted to be there. You know, and since then you've seen similar kind of protests, often called by individuals, called by school students, FE students. You know, you've seen five, up to 5,000 on the streets of Bristol. When you look at the pictures, it's an incredibly young, um, vibrant demonstration. Uh, and I know there's, there's a similar um, protest going to be happening here in Manchester on Saturday. You've seen people wanting to turn out and get organised. You've seen People's Assembly regular organising meetings that would normally have 20 or 30 people or 10 or 15 people having hundreds. You know, I know that, that happened here, didn't it? This week in Nottingham, 650 people turned out for the People's Assembly organising meeting. You know, so it's absolutely clear already that the, um, the demonstration on the 20th of June that was called months ago, quite rightly, because we knew whoever got in, there's going to be more austerity. Um, so that demonstration um, on the 20th of June is going to be absolutely massive, you know, potentially hundreds of thousands, and let's hope so. Um, so actually, I feel a lot better now than I did two weeks ago. I think things uh, feel quite different. But also, um, you know, that's because I have an understanding of where that anger is coming from. Uh, and that is coming from a recognition of what a Tory government means. So let's have a look just at, at what we are getting. Because very quickly, 
the Tories have come out, you know, announced their cabinet, started to talk about the policies they want to put through. And of course, next week we'll have the Queen's speech and see some of the more concrete plans. But straight away, you get the loathsome Michael Gove, you know, a man who supports hanging, put in as Justice Secretary. First thing he talks about is, is getting us out of the Human Rights Act. You know, what exactly is it that he finds so bad about the Human Rights Act? Is it that it is against torture? Is it that it supports free and fair elections? You know, what exactly is it that is the big um, problem for Michael Gove? Well, I can tell you that one of the things that he sees as a problem is that people have rightly been able to use the right to family life as something to stop families being broken up by you know, immigration laws and, and people being deported um, and so on. Uh, we saw Sajid Javid appointed as business secretary. His first move was to announce plans to ban strikes <coughs> unless 40% of those eligible vote for them. You know, how many Tory ministers would actually be elected if they applied that rule to themselves, actually, when you consider that this government was elected on whatever it was, 37% of the vote, but actually if you talk about everyone who was eligible to vote, then it's less than 24%. Um, you've got a new equalities minister, Caroline Dynage, who voted against equal marriage a couple of years ago. You've got Theresa May returning as Home Secretary, who's you know straight away announcing a, a war on extremism, which means an assault on Muslims, basically, an assault on, uh, uh, on Muslim um, people in schools, you know, with the prevent agenda in, in our public, uh, public um, services and so on. Um, and also you see her straight away speaking out against the idea of any refugees who are drowning in the Mediterranean being able to come to this country. You know, this is the, the woman in charge, is the woman who'd rather see people drown than, than allow the European Union, uh, you, know, to, uh, you know, allow this country to, to take on its responsibilities, really, um, of, of, of allowing people in. And then, you know, you've got Ian Duncan Smith, the man who is in charge of putting through the £12 billion of cuts in welfare, um, just for starters, really. Um, and you've got Cameron himself uh, today talking about seizing wages from immigrant workers who he decides shouldn't be allowed uh, you know, to earn money for the work that they do. Um, a man who one of the first things he talked about was, we've been far too tolerant for too long in this country. You know, when those words come out of the mouth, mouth of a Tory, I think, you know, it, it's a big problem, really. And we'll see next week exactly what they're going to start announcing, but we know that they've talked about things like attacks on maternity pay, um, attacks on the ability of young people to you know, access benefits like housing benefit and so on for people under 25s, same goes for incapacity benefit, talking about attacks on, on carers allowances, you know, there's all these kinds of things that you can see where some of that 12 billion is going to come from. So how did this happen really? Um, because I think it was Labour's election to lose, and, and they did that very successfully. Um, a couple of days after the election, there was an item on the radio which was trying to explain it potentially through a new scientific study which showed that people are scared of the colour red. Um, one other slightly less ridiculous analysis, in my opinion, is the idea that Labour was too left-wing. You know, and this has now become the, um, the kind of standard you know, uh, analysis really, this is the mainstream analysis that was instantly being put, you know, by the BBC and so on, but now is obviously being put inside the Labour Party as well and not really challenged in any serious way. So you've got all the Blairites coming out of the woodwork, you know, Tony Blair himself, people like Miliband, people like Jeff Hoon, all these people who are in the cabinet um, in the late 90s um, and, uh, and onwards uh, while Labour was in power. And, you know, saying that the main, main problem is that, that Ed Miliband is a red Ed in the pockets of the unions um, and so on. I think um, it should be clear to all of us in this room that we've never had the problem with Ed Miliband of him being too left wing. And, and I will come back, you know, to the question of, of the leadership debate and the debates going on inside of uh, the Labour Party and the unions today. But I do want to just kind of, you know, dispel some of, the, some of the kind of assumptions about the election result first off. Because actually the overall, you know, I don't think there was a massive 
uh, swing to the right or, or anything like this in terms of you know the, the bulk of people in Britain. You know, I, I, I come from a I grew up in a small town in Essex where the, the Tory majority went up in this election. I think for a lot of my friends from home, you know, really feel like they're walking around depressed, thinking, "Oh my God, is everyone I'm looking at a Tory? Did that person vote Tory? Did that person vote Tory?" And really, actually, when you look at the proportions. Um, not very much has changed in terms of the overall votes for the Labour Party or for the Tories. The key thing that really decided this election was the collapse of the Lib Dem vote, and, and rightly, you know, <laughs> they deserved, uh, they absolutely deserved it, really. Um, so the Lib Dem vote basically collapsed. They lost their deposit in 341 seats. This was the party that was has been the third party in this country for uh, many years now. Of course, unfortunately, and again I'll come back to this, the third party in terms of number of votes is now um, UKIP. Um, and this is something we'll have to deal with as well. But the Lib Dem vote kind of broke down pretty much both ways. Half of it went to um, the SNP, Plaid Cymru, the Greens uh, and the Labour Party. You know, and their kind of combined vote of that block that you could vaguely call left went up by about 7%. Um, but the other half went to the right, you know, and, and, and you see the, the votes of the Tories and UKIP added together up, also up about 7%. So what we're seeing is a bit of a polarisation really, you know, a milder form of what we see across Europe at the moment, particularly places like Greece and Spain that have been um, at the sharp end of austerity where you've seen, you know, kind of uh, left-wing parties like Syriza and Podemos um, being formed, as well as the rise of the far right, you know, like Golden Dawn in Greece, and so on. Um, I think what also happened is that the Tories were more effective at putting their argument, their pro-austerity argument, and also whipping up fear about the SNP. And they really played this big, didn't they? They, they tried to say to people, you know, uh, if you vote Labour, what you'll get is this mad Scottish woman who's a, an ultra-nationalist who will come down and try and destroy uh, the United Kingdom after however many centuries uh, that's existed, I can't remember. Um, so, you know, he whipped up all of this fear and Miliband fell in behind it, really. He did the, the mad thing of making, you know, literally saying that he'd rather, basically saying that he'd rather have a Tory government um, than do a deal with the SNP which was complete madness, really, in terms of what Labour's base, and, you know, what, where Labour's vote um, uh, uh, would come from and where the votes for the SNP in Scotland um, are coming from. But the argument about austerity is also really important because it's clear from, from um, polls that something like 46% of people in Britain agree with the pro-austerity argument, or at least they accept it. They accept that there's no alternative to austerity. And I think the main reason that people accept it is because no major political party has ever really challenged it. And this is the key thing that Labour failed to do, didn't they? Not just in the last few weeks, but in the last five years. They've never really challenged the idea that the crisis was caused by them overspending um, in, the last, um, in, the last, in the Parliament when the last one they were in charge. Um, and they've never really put an alternative to it, all they've done is say, you know, we could have slightly less austerity, we could cut things slightly slower, uh, and so on. So they've not really put an alternative at all. I think added to that is the, the Scottish factor, you know, the, the referendum campaign last year, um, when the Labour Party campaigned alongside the Tories um, for a no vote and, and to defend the union, if you like, of, of, of England and Scotland. Um, I think when they did that, Labour in Scotland broke the bond, really, between their traditional voters um, and the Labour Party. Um, and I think those traditional Labour voters in Scotland switched wholesale to the SNP, because the SNP have been articulating that anti-austerity um, politics that people want to hear. And they've really been talking, the SNP, their campaign wasn't about Scottish nationalism, it wasn't about independence, it was about social democratic principles really, it was like an old Labour kind of slogans that they were putting. And it shows that where you put that, and where people feel like you can make a difference, that's what people want. Um, so I think it just shows that far from being too left-wing, actually the Labour Party was far too weak and, uh, and not left-wing enough. Um, I think in Scotland, you know, it'll be interesting to see what happens, because obviously the SNP have made this massive breakthrough, now have 56 MPs um, in, in Westminster, and um, 
and people feel like all kinds of things might be possible. Uh, of course, they run their campaign on, in terms of anti-austerity, and their expectations are very high. But there are contradictions inside of that, because really, you know, the SNP, for example, they run um, Dundee Council already, and have been driving through cuts, actually, in, in that council in, in public services. You know, so it, it's not clear that they'll be able to deliver on, um, on the kind of um, politics that they put. However, you know, it's absolutely clear that, that the feeling of, of betrayal uh, that people have towards the Labour Party is very, very strong and it's going to continue. I mean, I do think, you know, it has been great seeing the SNP camp, uh, MPs come down to Westminster for the first time, seeing that, that young woman, the 20-year-old called Mary, who um, wrote a kind of a diary piece in one of the newspapers about how she went into the canteen at Westminster for the first time and went got her tray of food, she got chips and buttered bread or something and got tutted at for not being very healthy and then she went to find a table, sat down and all these women around the table said oh no you don't sit here, you have to sit over there and she was like a bit confused and she went to look at where they were pointing and there was a big kind of uh, a screen and a sign on it saying MPs only be on this point and she just saw I don't want to be like that. Um, you know, they, they, it was this canteen staff who were sitting at the first table she'd gone to, and she just turned around and went back and sat with them because she feels like, you know, she's not been elected in order to go off into some ivory uh, tower of, of special privileges. She wants to be part part of where, you know, ordinary people are and experience the same things as they experience. You know, and that's fantastic to see that um, in the Houses of Parliament because you don't get it half, you know, often enough. But we'll have to see, you know, what happens with those expectations. I think, you know, when you think about Miliband's campaign and the Labour Party's campaign in the election, you know, they did sometimes raise class arguments. They did talk about the mansion tax. They talked about scrapping the bedroom tax, opposing zero-hour contracts. You know, and when they did that, Miliband's polling went up. People liked it. This was obvious. Um, but then, you know, five minutes later, they'd go back to the kind of austerity light you know, accepting all the stuff um, about the need for cuts and so on. You know, he could have said so much more. He could have gone full out defending the NHS and saying, let's fund it properly, rather than saying uh, an NHS with time to care as one of their pledges. You know, like meaningless, empty statements on that giant stone tablet that's now in a garage in, in London or something. Um, you know, he, he could have said some very, very concrete things about £10 an hour minimum wage. He could have talked about homes for everyone that people can genuinely um, afford and so on. Um, and of course, they also put at the centre of their pledges controls on immigration. You know, so they feed into the, the racist kind of agenda um, that all the main parties have accepted um, about immigration somehow being a problem. Um, nonetheless, it's still true that, that most workers are going to vote um, for the Labour Party, in England at least. Um, the Labour Party's vote went up in London. In England overall, they actually got more votes than, than Tony Blair did in 2005, in the last election he won. You know, but there's this frag fragmentation, um, you know, to the Greens, Nationalists, um, and, and so on, and to people not voting at all. You know, in some Labour seats, the turnout was very, very low, and this is what allowed, you know, UKIP's vote to, you know, allowed UKIP to get into second place um, in all these places. And, and that's what I want to talk about next because, you know, the other big shift in the voting patterns in this election was um, UKIP's growth. Now, I think we should be really clear to say that UKIP didn't do well, they didn't achieve the aim that they wanted to achieve going into this election. They talked about wanting to come out of it with a real breakthrough with a whole number of MPs. Um, and, um, you know, and, and be able to push forward. And, you know, really the best moment of the day after the election was in the morning when Farage failed to win that seat um, in Thanet in Kent. You know, and I think that was the highlight, really, for, for most of us. And thank God he didn't win, and thank God people campaigned with Stand Up to UKIP in all of those target seats, and I think made a real difference. You know, in, in Thanet, where the Tory won, he only won by 2,000 votes. This isn't a lot, really, when you think about a general um, election. It does make you feel that the work that those um, tens and hundreds of activists did uh, can really make a difference to, to convince people not to vote um, for UKIP. Um, but UKIP came second in 120 seats, 40 of those um, Labour seats. 
They run Thanet Council now, they won, uh, they won in the council elections. And it's very clear that this is a racist vote, you know, it's built on the basis of anti-immigrant um, rhetoric. Uh, UKIP did not campaign on the basis of the European Union, you know, and this is not an issue that is high up on people's agendas, although it's going to become uh, uh, higher because, of course, the Tories have promised to have a referendum. But this was a vote that was built on the basis of anti-immigrant um, stuff. And, you know, 87% of UKIP voters see controlling immigration as one of the three key issues. And this is way, way, way higher than, than voters for any other party. So it's really important that we were part of those campaigns. And we'll have to continue to do that because they're building for the future as well. They're trying to lay foundations. The other thing we saw was, was um, socialist candidates standing, you know, in, in some places um, around the country. And uh, we were part of the trade unionist and the Socialist Coalition, which stood candidates, and then you had some campaigns here in Manchester, and I was involved in some down in London. And they were fantastic campaigns, I think, in a lot of places. It was a really good way of being a central part of the arguments that were going on in the course of the election campaign. It's very hard to be involved if you're not actually um, standing um, in those elections. And actually, you know, it meant that there was a whole layer of people who had a very clear anti-austerity voice and a principled stand against racism and all of these issues, standing as candidates, able to go out and have those debates with people and build up networks around them, really, of, of those kind of activists that we're going to need in, in the next few months and years to build the fight uh, against the Tories. But the reality is that the votes were pretty low in, in most places. I think there's, you know, there's some exceptions. There were some very good votes and also some very good votes in, in council um, seats where people stood. But in general, I think most of the people who might have agreed with Tusk's policies will have gone out and voted Labour at the end of the day because they want to, uh, they want to get rid of the Tories. You know, that, that doesn't mean it was wrong to stand. It means that we have to think about how we win over people um, in future to the idea of a real alternative, I think, uh, at the ballot box but one that's based on what we do on the ground actually between the elections because I think that's another thing we have to do is get the election in perspective because for me, you know, the, the fight against um, austerity is something that I was never expecting a Labour government to lead. You know, for me, I'd, I'd rather have not had another Tory government, but actually the fight against austerity is something that's going to have to come from us, it's going to have to come from the trade union movement, it's going to have to come from organisations, you know, on the ground fighting the cuts and so on. You know, for me, the best chance of beating Tory austerity wasn't two weeks ago at the ballot box. It was a few years ago, in 2011, when two and a half million public sector workers came out and struck in November 2011 over the pensions, these tax on pensions, and the attempts to kind of attack and, and privatise public services. You know, it, it was a, a real crime that the the union leaders allowed that, well, really called it off, basically, didn't they, after the first um, one-day strike, and didn't push through the fight that could have been. You know, I was going to end by talking about the brilliant national rail strike that's happening on uh, Monday and Tuesday, but, of course, that's now uh, been suspended. Um, they've been given an offer. Who knows? You know, maybe it's a good offer. I think it's, it's um, a wrong... Uh, a, a wrong strategy to actually call off the strike. I think you, workers need to show their power before they start bargaining, you know. So I think the last couple of things I guess I want to say is about what our priorities are um, uh, now, from now on really, because I think it's clear that things are not going to be easy for a Tory government with a majority of 12. You know, this is not a good situation for them to be in. Firstly, there's the constitutional issues that can explode. There's Scotland itself. You know, you can't have 56 SNP MPs and not have a debate about uh, a future independence campaign or, you know, and, uh, and having to do, you know, more devolution, etc., etc. There's the question of the European Union and a referendum, which now may be next year. You know, this is one of the issues that has torn the Tory party apart in the past, in, in the early 90s. Um, and there's at least probably 50 backbenchers who aren't going to follow the party line of, of staying in the European Union. 
you know, it's an issue that is going to be difficult for, for Cameron to keep on top of. And of course, we'll give UKIP a second wind and a second opportunity to get back um, in the media and build their side. I think it's also going to be tricky um, for us on the left because we need to put um, a left-wing argument against the European Union. You know, we need to say the European Union is an institution of neoliberal capitalists that is there simply in order to make it easier for European capitalists to make a profit without any impediments. You know, this is not something that I have an interest or any worker in Britain has an interest in supporting. But we have to make sure that we're able to put that argument as a, in an internationalist and anti-racist, you know, an anti-capitalist way and find allies who are going to be with us in that campaign because I don't want to be, you know, part of a no campaign that's, that's you know, Nigel Farage is, is part of. I think Labour at the moment, we can see that there is no possibility from the top at least of them moving to the left. We have a leadership campaign which is entirely full of Blairites, right-wingers, uh, the union man, Andy Burnham, what did he do? Oversaw the first PFI project in, in the NHS when, when Labour was last in power. He voted for the Iraq war. You know, he's, he's a right winger in the Labour Party. We've got, you know, a time when we should be saying the only way to really challenge austerity is to tax the rich. Actually, Liz Kendall, one of the candidates, is saying even a 50% top rate tax was mistaken. You know, this was going too far. You've got Mandelson writing saying, you know, when in the race, uh, in the election campaign where the Tories and Labour were competing over the arguments about austerity, he says, why did, why did Labour lose that argument? Partly because the rest of us do not pay for rich people's wealth, whereas general taxpayers do fund Britain's generous welfare system and sometimes feel that the unemployed are not just workless but work shy. Okay, so rich people's wealth magically appears out of nowhere, apparently, according to <laughs> Mandelson. Um, but we do pay, you know, through our taxes um, for everything else. I think we need to go way beyond the Labour Party's kind of frame of reference in terms of um, what is possible and say that actually all that wealth, it's not something that just floats separately from the work that people do every single day. You know, the only wealth that exists, exists because workers go to work they transport goods, they produce goods, they teach and educate people and make them healthy so they can go back to work. We do all of these things every single day. We create all of that wealth and you know, we won't be held to ransom and told that we have to pay again um, in order to keep the profits um, of big business up. I think that you know, as socialists, the, the job we have now is about building an alternative now. We can't wait five years for another government, as McCluskey would like us to do. We won't have five years to, to save all the services um, and, uh, and so on that we need to save. You know, it, it matters what happens in Labour, it matters what happens at, at the top of the unions, but the decisive question is what we do and what we're able to organise and influence in the networks that we're involved in, in the workplaces where, where we are, in the colleges and so on and link all of those struggles together to make a force that can tear down the Tories. Yeah.